مباركا فيه مباركا عليه كما يحب ربنا ويرضى جل جلاله وعم نواله والصلاة والسلام على سيد الحبيب المصطفى صلى الله تعالى عليه وعلى آله وصحبه وبارك وسلم تسليما كثيرا إلى يوم الدين أما بعد My dear respected علماء uh, dear brothers and sisters wherever they're listening are there sisters around here so? yes okay it's receivers okay. assalamu alaikum to everybody <coughs> the topic uh, for today is a rather a broad one the turmoil before the day of judgment it's a very relative thing when does that what when does this turmoil begin how much earlier than the Day of Judgment? It's a very relative term. When is the Day of Judgment? Nobody knows that. The last day. How far off are we? That's something that nobody knows. And nobody will ever know until it actually begins. Because there are a number of ahadith which contribute to the nature of this. The confusing nature of this. And it's meant to be confusing and unknown. So any predictions that are made that Mahdi has already been born and so on and so forth, that really goes against what the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, his own perspective towards this, which is to have kept it unknown. So today there are people who are becoming excited about the fact that Mahdi is born and this is the the worst of situations that the Muslims will ever face and so on and so forth. Now if I was to tell you that right now we're in 1432, 33 Hijri, we're in the 1400s after the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam's migration. When it was in the 900 and something, Imam Suyuti's time, Imam Suyuti passed away on 9-11. 9-11 Hijri that is. That was his 9-11 Hijri, that's not our 9-11 as such and he wrote a book he had to discuss the issues about people thinking that the day of judgment was going to occur and the world was going to end at the centenary of the the, the hijrah which is at the thousand years of the hijrah that's gone four five hundred years ago and qiyamah has not come yet and yet qiyamah could come tomorrow so that's the way these things work If you look at the signs of the Day of Judgment, you've got hadith in there which the Prophet ﷺ said that before the Day of Judgment comes, or as it draws closer, time will contract. So much so that a year will seem like a, a year will seem like a month, and a month will seem like a week, a week like a day, and a day will just fizzle out, like a small piece of fire would just fizzles out when you ignite it. And I'm sure we experience some of that. I'm sure that if you go to different countries of the world, you will experience different levels of time. In the sense that in some places, time seems to be suspended. You get more out of your day than you get in other places. And probably in England, London is probably the worst part in, worst in that sense. In the sense that we have absolutely no time. Despite the many conveniences and amenities that the modern technology and progress has provided us and yet we still don't have any time it is such a it is such a juxtaposition it is such a contradiction that just confuses man and yet the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam mentioned that that will happen so despite many facilities many uh, things that are supposed to have made life easy for us to get from point a to point b to make your coffee in 2 minutes as opposed to 10 minutes and things of that nature yet still we don't have time now, if we look at what the Prophet ﷺ mentioned, the reason I want to say this is that all of these things have been mentioned to make us think and to prepare. There's no point waiting for the Mahdi. We've got something a lot more critical to think about whether Mahdi comes tomorrow or 200 years or 1,000 years after this. And we must realize that. There have been many times in past history, in, in the 1400 years of Islam, where literally people thought that this was going to be the end of the world. Numerous occasions, numerous occasions, either because of natural catastrophes, there were major plagues, the plague of Amwas, there were many different plagues in different parts of the world where there were 
killings, uh, people just died in huge numbers. 70,000 people died. 70,000 people a day were dying in different parts of the world. The drought was so destructive that in Egypt people had to resort to cannibalism during the time of the Fatimids in Egypt. Then there was the onslaught of the Tartars and they just swept through the cities one after the other. So much so that when they swept through these cities, for example, when they swept through Herat, which is in current day Afghanistan, at that time it was called Khurasan. When they swept through Herat, there were only seven people that came out of the rubble. Absolutely everybody was destroyed. Bukhara, Samarkand, all of these main cities of the Mawara al Nahr and Transoxiana, all of these areas which is completely destroyed by the Tatars. When they entered into, into Baghdad, they killed 800,000 people or a million people. And people thought that was the end. And that was the Islamic Darul Khilafah of the time. That was the time of the Abbasids. The Abbasid Caliphate. And yet, so many people were killed. And the Khalif himself was killed by the Tatars. And there was a superstition that the Khalif's blood should not touch the ground. Otherwise, something very bad would happen. And they believed that. That was the only thing they had a strong belief in. So then they decided how to kill the Khalif and they rolled him up in a rug and beat him to death. So you have, we've had all of these things happen. We've had about 90 years after the second crusades when not a single salat was performed in Masjid Al-Aqsa. Today we've got a problem there. But at least salat is performed. And there's no cross on top of the Qubba al sahra Whereas before Salahuddin rahimahullah liberated it, for 90 years, there was no salat there. And the carnage that had to be wrought on the, the Christians of that city and on the people of that city, on the Muslims of that city, by the Christians, by the Christians of the Crusades, was something that was probably never precedented. And then Salahuddin took it back. So you've got all of these instances. Now if we go back to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he said many things that turned out to be absolutely correct. Now, if we look at what he said, there are, we can distribute it into three different sections. Firstly, the Prophet ﷺ said many things, which from our perspective, being in this 14th, 15th century Hijri, we could see as past signs. The Prophet ﷺ said very specific things and they happen exactly like that. They happened exactly like that. Some things were absolutely so dot on, so point on that it was just amazing. But that's our belief that the Prophet ﷺ was divinely inspired by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave him this knowledge and he imparted some of this to the people. Then there are the current signs or the <coughs> continuous signs. The Prophet ﷺ made certain statements about continuous signs which will only get worse until the Day of Judgment. And then he spoke about the umur idham, which means that the major signs. So many people have distributed this into minor signs and major signs. But I would believe that the minor signs are also early signs and later signs from our perspective. The difference between a minor sign and a major sign, one perspective of that is that the minor sign are those which will not necessarily be global and affect everybody at once. They will affect different people in different parts of the world in different intensities. For example, the Prophet ﷺ said, disobedience to parents will take place. Now, disobedience to parents is worse in some cities and some countries than in other countries. The prevalence of singing women. This is prevalent in some areas. It's not as prevalent in certain other areas. You may argue that with the satellite dish, it becomes prevalent around the world and it becomes a global phenomenon. You could definitely argue that way. But there are no hard and fast rules of def defining the minor and major signs. Except that we know the major signs is when things will really start to take a turn. Start to take a turn and that will be the turn towards the Day of Judgment. So these are the minor signs. Then there are the major signs. And the major signs, they, that, that is what comprises of the Dajjal, the Antichrist. Mahdi alayhi salam, Isa alayhi salam, Gog Magog, Ya Juj Ma'juj, the Daba and so on. So let us take a quick look at uh, throughout our history in terms of what the Prophet said 
it's virtually impossible for us to cover everything in a very short span of time. But just to give you some highlights of the different things that the Prophet ﷺ said, it will inshallah increase our faith in the Prophet ﷺ, increase our iman, our iman in the religion that he has brought, and we will see that God is very much, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is very much still in control. And all of these things are happening as perfectly as has been prophesied by the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And then we will speak about our responsibility. Because there's no point giving us a tour of the different things that have happened and the things that may happen. Yes, they do, they do make for very interesting talk. They do create a lot of interest. But that's not the point of this. The point of this is that whether there's an interesting talk or a discussion, how are we going to take part in this? Because at the end of the day, tomorrow, as the... Maulana was saying before myself, before, before I came on, we have to stand in front of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is not going to ask us, did you wait for the Mahdi? Did you prepare for his coming? Because that's not the point. Mahdi is just a situation, is, a, is, is an aspect that this, the course of this world will, will eventually show. Whether we are there or not is a different story. The thing is that we each have responsibilities, regardless of whether, whether Mahdi or Dajjal or uh, anybody else comes in our lifetime. Because we are all connected to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in our own very unique ways. So let us start from the beginning. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he mentioned a few things. For example, there's a hadith that's related by Imam Bukhari. That Umar radiallahu an once asked Hudayfa radiallahu an. Hudayfa radiallahu an was the keeper of the secrets of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. There are many things that the Prophet ﷺ did not mention in public. He only told a few individuals. One of them was Hudayfa radiyallahu anhu. He was probably known to be told many of these things. Things that he did not always divulge to others. Sometimes he mentioned something after a fact. For instance, he, when, if you wanted to know whether somebody was a hypocrite that died in Medina, if you wanted to see if he was a hypocrite or not, after the time of the Prophet ﷺ, you would see if Hudayfa radiyallahu anhu attended his funeral or not. And if he didn't, then there was a likelihood that that person was a munafiq and the Prophet ﷺ had told, had told him about that. But there were many other things that were told. So Umar knew about this. He was, very, he was always very, very concerned about these matters. So Umar once asked Hudayfa about the fitna, which had been, he had heard that it had been described as the fitna, the turmoil, the test, the problem, the mischief, an issue that will plague the ummah and will occur in such a way that it will be like the waves of the ocean. So he asked Hudayfa radiallahu anhu, can you tell me about that? And Hudayfa radiallahu anhu, he would always give a very symbolic kind of response. He would say, he said in this case, Ya Amir al-Mu'mineen, la ba'sa alayk. O leader of the faithful, you have no problem. It's, it will not affect you. Don't worry about it. Umar radiallahu anhu was always concerned. So he asked Hudayfa radiallahu anhu, that I've heard about this fitna, can you tell me about it? He said, you don't have to worry about it. Because in the baynaka wa baynaha bab, bab and mu'allaq, sorry, bab and mughlaq, that between you and it, there is a door which is closed. There is a locked door between you and this fitna that you speak about. Umar radiallahu an immediately clicked on and he said, Ayuftahul bab, O yuksar, will this door be broken or opened? There's a door between me and the fitna, but will it be opened or broken? And that's when Hudayfa radiallahu an said, La bal yuksar, it will be broken. It will be broken. And then Umar radiallahu an said, Thaka ahra alla yughlaq, then maybe it was better if it was never, it was never closed. And this is exactly as took place. This was a very symbolic response. That this door will be broken and not opened. Umar radiallahu an was literally the door in his over 10 years as Khalif. The way he established the, the Muslims after the turmoil that had set in after Abu Bakr uh, during Abu Bakr radiallahu an's time. Which Abu Bakr radiallahu an laid the groundwork of. Because after the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa passed away, there were many different tribes and people around different areas which decided 
that, oh, we're going to take this aspect of Islam and we're going to reject this aspect. We, they began to pick and choose and kind of manipulate their faith to suit themselves because now they reckon that the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam had left this world. Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu in his over two years, he went and he settled the situation with Khalid bin Walid and uh, other Sahaba. He, he managed to stabilize the situation, get everybody back on the single kalima, on the one kalima of Tawheed and all of the different aspects of the religion. When Umar radiallahu anhu became the Khalif, he was able to take this a lot further. After Umar radiallahu anhu's time, now Umar radiallahu anhu was martyred. He was in the Salatul Fajr. He had already started the Salat. And you can imagine in Masjid al-Nabawi, this is the Amir al-Mu'minin, he's leading the Salat. Thousands of people are probably behind him. And this person had hid, this Abu Lu'lu'ah, he was a Persian slave or a servant, uh, he had hidden in, in, one of the, in one of the corners of the, the masjid or somewhere around the masjid. And it's dark in the morning. It's not bright like this in those days. And he came and he attacked Umar radiallahu anh with a double-sided, a double-sided dagger. And Umar radiallahu anh, now the people at the back didn't even know what had happened. It was such a large congregation. One of the other sahaba went forward. He continued the salat. And Umar radiallahu anh was finally taken away. After... After some time, Umar radiallahu anhu passed away very shortly after that. That was a fatal blow. And he remained alive for a while to say a few different things, to give a few, uh, few different orders about where he had to be buried. He gave some advice and so on. But this is what Hudhayfa radiallahu anhu said, that this door will be broken and it will not be opened. After that comes the time of Uthman radiallahu anhu. In the beginning, there's again, Uthman radiallahu anhu continues with what, Uthman, what Umar radiallahu anhu had had begun. But towards the end of it, Uthman radiallahu anhu had be, had, was quite old as well by now. But towards the end of it, an insurgency was created. Certain individuals, we don't have the time to go into this in great detail, but there was an insurgency that was created. And finally that ended with Uthman radiallahu anhu being martyred. Now again, there we have we have a hadith in which Aisha radiallahu anha reports. A numerous hadith about this. This is not the first one. But Aisha radiallahu anha reports in this, in this particular narration, which is narrated by Ibn Majah and Imam Hakim and others, that Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam once called Uthman radiallahu anha. Uthman radiallahu anha, just to understand his personality and his demeanor, he was a very, very, uh, he was a very noble kind of man. In a sense that he was not one to... Uh, not, not, he was not a very brash person He was a very humble person He was very wealthy But at the same time He carried a lot of dignity within him He, had, he carried a lot of dignity He was a very very uh, kind of noble person in that regard The Prophet ﷺ invited him, called him And he said something in his ear He whispered to him And you could see Aisha radiallahu anhu reports That I could see that Uthman radiallahu anhu's face was changing color Changing color. And during the time this insurgency became more intense and they were going to attack, many of the Sahaba wanted to fight back against this insurgency, against Uthman radiallahu anhu. But Uthman radiallahu anhu absolutely refused. He would not let anybody take up any kind of weapon against anybody. Finally, Uthman radiallahu anhu was martyred. But Uthman radiallahu anhu would say that the Prophet sallallahu told me that you will be given a, a garment to wear. People will try to take it from you. Don't let them take it off you. And that was, his, that was the message to him that you will be given the Khilafah. They will try to take it away from you and extract it. Because they kept saying, Uthman radiallahu anh, you needs to give up the position, give up the post and give it to somebody else because he's not capable of doing so. That was, that was their demand. And he would not do that because he had been told by the Prophet wasallam that that will happen. And it's exactly the way it happened. And finally he was martyred. Uthman radiallahu anh made a few statements at that time. He told the people in an address to them. He said that, look, I have followed the exact ways of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and Abu Bakr siddiq radiallahu anh. If, your, if you unsheathe your sword right now, then it will never again be resheathed. And this was such an important statement that we feel the repercussions of that until today. Because when his blood was spilt, the sword was taken out and unsheathed. It was never, never again, uh, never again resheathed. In the sense that after that, so many thousands of Sahaba, so many thousands of people and Muslims were killed after that. Something that was absolutely unprecedented. Because then became then Ali radiallahu anh becomes the Khalif. And again, the Prophet had mentioned certain things to 
to him as well. He'd said, he, he once said uh, among his wives that how will it be when one of you will, will, uh, when, how will it be when the dogs of Hawab will bark at one of you? Hawab is a place. And Aisha radiallahu anha, she, she smiled. She said, how is that possible? You know, she felt that that was a, a very strange statement in a sense. But the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa turned around to her and said, Ya Humaira, that was his, uh, his pet name for her. Ya Humaira, he said, Make, be careful that it's not you. And then Ali radiallahu anhu was there, so he turned to Ali radiallahu anhu, and he said that if you are ever given the reins of her affairs, in the sense that if, you are, if she is ever under you, uh, under you in, in your control, in a sense that you, know, you, have to, you have to administrate her affairs, then make sure that you are lenient with her. So many years afterwards, during the time of Ali radiallahu an, when people encouraged Aisha radiallahu anha to get up and to seek the, the, uh, seek the blood of Uthman radiallahu an, to seek uh, those who had created this insurgency and who had martyred Uthman radiallahu an, and Ali radiallahu an felt it prudent at that point to consolidate the matters of the ummah first, to, to stabilize the situation. You can't go after thugs if the situation is not stable. But others who did not know that situation, how bad it was, they couldn't understand. They couldn't understand why Ali radiallahu anhu was not initially going after. When, you, when you've got chaos in your area, you can't just go up and start going after people who you don't even know who they are, maybe. So that was his perspective. But Aisha radiallahu anha, her perspective, she was told, so she tried to rally, uh, rally Ali radiallahu anhu to, to do something about it. Then there was uh, an incident between the two. And when Aisha radiallahu anha was going on her way, she came to a place where she suddenly heard dogs barking. And immediately, you know, she, she was a very intellectual woman, radiallahu anha. She said, Which, what is this place? And they told her that this place is called Hawab. She says, I better get going back. Because the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said that how will it be when the dogs of Hawab will bark at one of you? And, you know, she had felt that so far-fetched at that time. But anyway, then we have, we, we carry on to Muawiyah radiallahu an and Ali radiallahu an. Ali radiallahu an had to deal with a lot of the khawarij, a lot of the problems during his time. Imam Ahmad relates from Abu Huraira radiallahu an that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, O oh Muawiyah, he said to Muawiyah radiallahu an that if you are ever give, ever, if you are ever made in charge of the affairs of the Muslims, then make sure you fear Allah and that you are just. Treat them justly and fear Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Muawiyah said that as soon as I heard that or from the time that I heard that from the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, I knew that I was going to be tested with this position. I knew I was going to be put in this position to be tested because of what the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam had said. And then eventually that is exactly what happened. Finally, after Ali radiallahu anhu was also martyred, and what happened then, again, it's something which a group of khawarij. Now these were people who were on some high level of what they thought was, uh, they were uh, on some high level of literal interpretation of uh, the Quran and Sunnah. And they felt that they knew more than Abdullah ibn Abbas radiallahu anhu, Ali radiallahu anhu, and others. And they had their own very strict and rigid interpretation of the Quran. They felt that Ali radiallahu anhu had gone against the deen because of his... Uh, so-called ceasefire or peace treaty with Muawiyah radiallahu an and Amr ibn al-As radiallahu an. So they decided to send three people to go and mu murder these uh, Muawiyah radiallahu an, Amr ibn al-As radiallahu an, and Ali radiallahu an. The one that went to Muawiyah radiallahu an, he attacked him. Muawiyah was a very, very uh, large person, well endowed, very large person. And when he was struck, he, he, he wasn't a deadly blow, so he, he, he was saved. The one that went after Amr ibn al Amr ibn al happened to be sick that day. So he did not go to lead the Fajr Salat. Somebody else did. And that person was, was attacked in, in his place. And these were all in different areas. These were in Damascus and uh, Ali radiallahu an was elsewhere. Ali radiallahu an, he was attacked and he was martyred. So after Ali radiallahu an, the people gave bay'ah to Hassan, his son radiallahu an. Now Hassan radiallahu an, again the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa had said to him that you will be the cause of peace between two mighty group of Muslims. 
And this he had said about Hassan when he was a young boy. That this son of mine, this grandson of mine, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will use him to reform the, uh, the, uh, the affairs of the Muslim ummah in that sense. When he was given the khilafah for about six months, he wrote to Muawiyah radiallahu anhu and he said that I will turn this over to you. And he made a few conditions and he said I will turn this over to you. He felt that the best way to, have the, uh, to consolidate the Muslim ummah again was this way. So he went, he told Muawiyah radiallahu anhu. Muawiyah radiallahu anhu accepted. And then Muawiyah became the khalif. And as you see, the Prophet had told him that you will get this, this will happen and make sure that you are just and you, uh, you, you treat the people with, with justice. So you have a number of things. Now when, Muawiyah, when Ali radiallahu an was, had this skirmish with Muawiyah radiallahu an, there were a number of sahaba, high prominent, high profile sahaba involved on either side. You had Talha and Zubair. Talha and Zubair, they were... One, uh, they were, uh, both of them were part of the ten that had been glad, uh, given glad tidings of paradise. So with regards to Zubair radiallahu anhu, for example, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa said, تُقَاتِلُهُ وَأَنْتَ لَهُ ظَالِمُ He told Zubair that you will, you will quarrel or fight with Ali radiallahu anhu, whereas you will be his oppressor. You will be on, in the oppressing side. He had forgotten that. So when he was fighting on the opposite side against Ali radiallahu anhu, Ali radiallahu an managed to see him and meet him and he reminded, do you remember the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa said that you will fight with me and you will be the oppressor? When Zubair radiallahu an heard that, he immediately remembered what the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa had said and he desisted from it. He desisted, he left the war immediately. Then on the other side with Ali radiallahu an, there was Ammar ibn Yasir radiallahu an. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa had mentioned about him that taqtuluhu al-fi'atul baghiyah that the, the side which is on the wrong, that have gone against the, the rightful position, the rightful khalif, they will be, sorry, they will kill him. And he was killed by somebody from the side of Muawiyah radiallahu anhu, which proves that Ali radiallahu anhu was more on the correct opinion in this regard. In the sense that there's always going to be one truth in anything. For example, let's just say that there's a divorce case, and you go to three muftis, and each one of them, each one of these jurists give you a different opinion. One says, it is a talaq, but it's a talaq raji'i, it's a revocable divorce. And another one says, no, it's a talaq ba'in, it's an irrevocable divorce. Another one says, it's not divorce at all. Right? Now, all three can't be right, can they? Only one three is going to be right, only one of those three are going to be right according to Allah. But each one has probably done their best to understand the situation and provide a ruling. Right? So you have to go with whoever is right, whoever you think is righteous and trustworthy in this world. But in reality, only one can be true according to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That's what I'm trying to explain. So for example, even when we go into the four madhabs, and one says you raise your hands, and another one says you say ameen aloud, and another say you don't. One of them, according to Allah, is probably the best opinion. But we have to follow whatever we think is best according to the knowledge that we have and what the Imams have told us. So that's the way the responsibility of each mufti, each jurist is to give the best possible opinion according to their understanding that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has, has given them the qualifications for. <coughs> but at the end of the day, only one thing can be true according to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So in this case, though Muawiyah radiallahu an, Aisha radiallahu anha, Talha Zubair, they were fighting for the right cause and they didn't have any personal motives. It was demanding the right thing, but they saw things in a different way. So they were not incorrect in the sense of they were not in, in unjust in terms of what they were trying to ask. But Ali radiallahu an had a better understanding of the situation and he was more correct in that regard. However, this is not a history lesson. The point I'm trying to say, the point I'm trying to say is uh, the point I'm trying to make rather is that with all of these things, which I've just skimmed over, the Prophet ﷺ had made some very penetrating, very specific remarks, and each of them came to be absolutely true. Now, if we fast forward a few years, right? If we fast forward a few years, and we get to... This is... A few hundred years afterwards. But the Prophet ﷺ had made this statement during his time. Again, a hadith related by Imam Bukhari and Imam Hakim from Abu Huraira radiallahu an. The Prophet ﷺ said that hatta hatta min ardil hijaz. 
The Prophet ﷺ said that the day of judgment cannot occur, will not occur, until a fire erupts from, Hij- from the land of Hijaz. And it will, be, it, it will illuminate the necks of the camels of Busra. Right? But not Basra. Basra is a new city that was established after the time of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam in uh, current day uh, Iraq. This is Busra, Busra Sham, which is in the Levant, which is just south of Damascus. You're talking about several hundred kilometers away from Medina Munawwara, Ardul Hijaz, and in others it's about Medina. It mentions Medina. So Ardul Hijaz, Hijaz is the western province, western board of 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 the Arabian Peninsula. A fire will erupt from there, which will illuminate the necks of the camels of Busra. Many hundred miles away. Can you imagine that statement? However, this happened. A, firstly, it began in Medina Munawara. Just outside Medina Munawara, there were many earthquakes, tremors. And then a fire erupted. But by that time, now think of the response of the people when a natural catastrophe like that is occurring. When they see an impending danger. We, what we do is we just watch for details. We put on Al Jazeera, right? We put on the BBC and whatever else that we look at. And we're just looking for information. We just want to hear about it. See it. You know, make it more vivid. That's, that's what we do. And sometimes they say, may Allah have mercy on them. May Allah have mercy on them. But look at what these people did. Everybody rushed to the masjid. Men, women and children. The, 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 the ruler of the time, he freed all of his slaves. And they were all in such, because now what happened is that a massive, it was, there was an eruption. It's called a fire, but it was an eruption of lava from one of the, one of the, vol, uh, the vo- volcanic, it was, there was a volcanic movement and lava erupted. But it was ajib because it was just moving towards Medina Munawwara. Because if you go today, there are two massive lava tracks just outside Medina. Very dark. We, we hardly ever get to see that. But if you actually travel outside Medina, there are these black, completely black areas. And there are volcanoes in that area. And this only happens like in many hundred years. But the Prophet ﷺ had mentioned that this is, he, he mentioned as a major fire. It would just consume everything in its wake. And it was coming, it was traveling slowly, but it was coming towards Medina Munawwara. Directly. And when you say Medina Munawwara, it's very small. It wasn't a sprawling city of the, at the time. You know, the masjid was the center, the masjid al Nabawi, and then things surrounding it. The people saw this as an absolute impending danger. They gave up everything, they went to the masjid. And they were just there making salat in sajda, in prostration, seeking forgiveness for their sins, crying, and trying to, uh, trying to entreat Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in this humble way. To, to remove this. And miraculously what happens, and geolo- geologists today are absolutely dumbfounded as to how this could have happened. This fire, this lava, was coming exactly towards the masjid, in the sense that it was coming towards Medina Munawwara. But just a short distance before, before it, it suddenly took a turn. Who could turn this thing? It was literally consuming and melting everything in its, in its way. I mean, that, that's what it was. It was just leaving just heaps of... It was just so bright that you could see a city in it, they said. Which means that the, the flames and, or the, 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 the bubbling of it was such that it seemed like skyscrapers could be seen in it. That's how people described it at the time. But such a thing to just suddenly take a literally just like a, a sharp turn. But now you can see from this that du'as are powerful. But de- de- depending on the amount of danger there is, your dua needs to be that much stronger. Allah wants to see you how much your iman is. The people had iman. They weren't just watching it. They weren't just spectators. You know, this is what we have turned to become. Spectators of these things. We don't make the dua for it. Because duas do have this power. But again, another aspect of it is the fact that the Prophet ﷺ had mentioned this so clearly. Because... What happened now south of Damascus, now I traveled from Medina Munawara by bus to, to Jordan. 
to Amman, Jordan. And that took about 14 hours, right? It, it takes a long time. It is quite a distance. The shepherds and the Bedouins of that area, they said that, at that on that night, and obviously they're not known about, you know, they, they, they were not in connection with the people of Medina Munawwara, that, oh, this is happening there. What they saw was that at night there was such brightness that they could see the necks of their camels in that area, in Busra, which is in Syria today. And then later they discovered that it was actually from there. But the Prophet Sallallahu's prophecy was just so apt that they would be able to see it. So these I would call the early signs. So perfect, just so dot on. And then you go, I would consider the, the, the second group of signs to be called the intermediate signs. For example, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, a famous hadith, that the day of judgment will not occur until the most fortunate person in this world will be Luka ibn Luka, the base-born son of a base-born. What that is trying to talk about, now, this is not class racism, this is not talking about that. This is speaking about a person who you would never think could become, have any leadership qualities, could be considered to be fortunate, because they've been mean people all along. They've been mean people all along. They've just been very despicable kind of people. But yet, respect of such people will grow. So much so that they will be considered to be the most fortunate person. Now, today, I was listening to the radio some time ago. And the talk show host is talking about children wanting to be famous nowadays. You know, one is that your son or daughter wants to be a famous scientist a proficient, a proficient expert in something. You know, a great Mawlana, a great Mufti, a great Shaykh al-Hadith, or whatever it may be. That's absolutely fine. Those ambitions are good. Right? We need to support those ambitions. Because in order to become a major scientist or an architect or whatever it may be, you need to work accordingly. You can't just become one of those things. But increasingly so, children are saying, we want to be famous. What do you want to do? I don't know. We just want to be famous. Now how do you be famous? Now where they're getting this from is places like MTV and other places. Where some of the most unqualified people as such from any kind of vocational perspective. Where all you've got is your body. Right? All you've got is a body. That you will spend money to mold in a particular way. And go and spend lots of money... Dancing schools in the last decade or so has, have increased like crazy. Dancing schools to teach people dancing. And this is one of the fastest ways to stardom. Short-lived stardom, but stardom nonetheless. Famous. This is what children are wanting to do. Now when you've got a child who just wants to be famous, but doesn't know how to be famous or what to be famous in, he's got something in the back of his mind obviously then you can imagine that the focus of that will just be to cut corners to try to get some kind of fame, however that may be. Whether that means dealing in drugs so you can get those chains around your, around your neck. Or to drive the big Escalades and the big Cadillacs. So we must realize that there's kind of this perspective, distorted perspective about these things. Another hadith, which when I first read it, I just couldn't make sense of it. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said that the day of judgment will not occur until a time will come when a person will distance his mother and bring close his wife. Basically, he will be, no, it says he will be obedient to his wife and disobedient to his mother. Now, there's nothing wrong with being obedient to your wife. If she's got something good to say, I mean, you should be obedient. If she knows which school your son or daughter should go to because you don't care and she does and she goes and studies the best schools in the area and she's making those decisions, you say, no, 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 I want to go here because that's where I went, right? That's a bit ridiculous. You should listen to your wife when, you know, in, in the things that she knows more than you about, right? If she knows that it's Salat time and you don't know, you have to listen to your wife, right? So... The problem here though is that the Prophet is not saying that you shouldn't be 
obedient, that you should not that you should be disobedient to your wife. He's saying that before the day of judgment, people will be obedient to their wife and disobedient to their mother. They go together. For instance, a story is related that a in Saudi Arabia, you know when people go for Umrah and Hajj, I'm sure many of us will know this. Many people know this. When people are going for Umrah and Hajj, what they do is they, a lot of women will take their gold with them. Because there's a lot of gold bazaars and gold souks around that area. Right? Around the Masjid al-Nabawi and other areas. Right? And, you know, they've had this gold necklace and set or whatever for 10-15 years and they've gotten a bit tired of it. The husband's a bit sick of seeing it now. Right? So now they want to get a new set. So what they go there is they go there and they you know, they give that in, it gets weighed up, and then, you know, you get a new set. I can see all of these head shakes, right? So, that's part of the umrah that people do, right? The, the gold exchange. Um, I'm not saying it's haram, I'm just mentioning it, right? So, there's a story that's related that this young couple come along all excited, right? You know, these rich Khaliji people, very, mashallah, they got a lot of money. So, it comes, brings his wife in, and along with that comes an old woman, into one of these gold shops and she's holding a little child. So, the husband's there showing all of these different sets. Oh, look at this one, look at this one, pick whichever one you want. You know, he's in a romantic mood. Right? And finally, she picks something. At, the, at that time, the old woman, you know, is standing there. You could assume it's the mother. It's his mother looking after their newborn child. So, okay, 10,000 riyal, for instance. So, the shopkeeper says 10,700. He said, why is that? You know, I know it's 10,000, you said. He said, yes, but... So he points to the mother. And she had, bichari, fa, fa, uh, she had poor woman, had found a little ring, which she wanted to get for Eid. And the husband just... T the, 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 the son, the husband of the wife, just turns around to her and says, old woman, what do they want with gold? Just imagine the situation. He's so excited about buying his wife expensive set, telling her, buy what you like. Poor mother picks up a, you know, a small ring, nothing in comparison to what they're buying. And he's like, old women and gold? What's that got to do with each other? She puts the ring down and just walks out of the shop, goes towards the car. Now, the wife turns around to the husband and says, look what you've done. She's not going to look after our baby anymore. I mean, I think it's something to cry about. I don't think it's something to laugh about. I'm serious. It, it, it's serious. And so the husband, okay, picks up the ring, goes out, looks for his mother and says, you know, here you go. She says, Wallahi, I've taken an oath by Allah that I will never wear gold again until I die. <clears throat> and th this is when a person doesn't understand the respect. He's so much in love and romance with the wife that he doesn't respect the mother. Now look, I know there are situations when the mothers are making it unbearable for their children. I completely understand that as well. So, you know, th those people who don't use this as an evidence against their daughter-in-laws. Daughter-in-laws are also very persecuted sometimes. Because what happens with the mother is that she loves her son, the son loves her, and then gets her married, and she's all excited about it. But then discovers that, oh, this son, so, uh, my, my, my son actually loves somebody else now. So she becomes an enemy. She becomes an enemy. And she can't rationalize it. And it becomes really bad. So that's unreasonable nature. But even in, even in that case, we're told to be polite. If she tells you to beat your daughter, sorry, your wife, we're not to listen to our mother. Because that's haram. Obedience is not in haram things. This is out of respect. But the, what the Prophet ﷺ is saying in this hadith, that the day of judgment will not occur until a person obeys his wife, which is nothing wrong with that, but disobeys his mother in obeying his wife. That's the issue. Okay, let's put that one. Let's go move on to the next one. Then he said, the Prophet ﷺ said, that a person with, will bring close his friends and distance his father. Now, Bringing close your friends, is nothing wrong with that. So if you look at the first part of the hadith, bringing close your friends, there's nothing wrong with that. But you have to read it together with the second one. Bring close his friends, 
but distance his father. How do you do that? Tell me, how do you do that? You're living with your parents. You're, you're in the same room sometimes. How can you still be closer to your friends? Amazing. You're in your room. You're sitting in the room where your mother and father and the whole family is sitting. You might be sitting next to your mother or father. But you will be closer to your friends. Welcome to Facebook. You will be closer to your friends in the sense that you're chatting away with them. You're doing different things. You're in a different world. And your family is in a different world, yet you are next to each other. That doesn't make Facebook haram. I'm not saying, I'm not giving any fatwas here. I'm just talking about a phenomena. The craze. And what the Prophet ﷺ said. There could be other explanations of this. There could be other manifestations of this. But then this is one of them. Where you poke people on there. Right? <clears throat> so, that's what the Prophet ﷺ said. And then further on, the Prophet ﷺ said, and noise, clamor will be, clamor will be elevated in the masajid. What that means is that there'll be a lot of noise in the masajid. People will either lose respect for the masjid, or people will be at each other's throats for small issues, that they won't even have a problem in arguing in the masjid, while they're in the masjid. And again, we have the moon issue. And sometimes the first day of Ramadan and the day of Eid is an argument in the masjid in some place. May Allah protect us. But anyway, these are just different things that the Prophet ﷺ said. <coughs> the Prophet ﷺ mentioned other things that Zalazil, earthquakes will become more prominent, will become more widespread and prevalent. There will be subterranean sinkings or subterranean collapses. That is khasf. Khasf means where suddenly a sinkhole will appear and everything on top will just absolutely and totally just, just, just completely disappear into the ground, will sink. And we've had that in numerous places. I think there was a recent one in Bolivia or somewhere else where you can literally see where the, the house that's next door is still standing, but next to it is a massive gaping hole. And every, all the houses next to it have just suddenly disappeared. There are obviously geological explanations for this but why there and nowhere else right. you know if it was such a firm thing nobody would live there if people really knew it's up to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala but these are things that the Prophet ﷺ said that these sinkings will take place he talked about transmutation which is people's face changing into something else a kind of evolutionary process if you might want to call it but the main thing is zalazil zalazil which is earthquakes. Now you see that there are earthquakes taking, uh, I mean, happening in places that hitherto were unknown to be earthquake prone. So, khalas, that's, that's another aspect. Let's fast forward to the major signs. When all of these minor signs, they will continue, they will become more intense. And finally, there will be great chaos in this world. Because the Prophet ﷺ said that yakthur al harj, harj. Harj is al qatl. There will be a lot of killing. And now you see, just in the Middle East, of how many people have been just killed for nothing. Absolutely, just asking for their rights, asking just for justice, for better living conditions, basic hum human, human needs. Nothing more than that. And p for single people to want to hold on to their position at the expense of thousands. You've seen how these things can happen. When these things will increase... And again, I'm not making any prediction. I'm just saying exactly what the Prophet ﷺ is telling us. When these things will increase, because these are all signs of the Day of Judgment. These are all minor signs of the Day of Judgment. Then finally, ulama, to try to find a solution. And this is mentioned in certain narrations. That the ulama, the, 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 the true ulama of the different parts of the world, will constantly be going for hajj every year to look for the Mahdi. Because we know from the ahadith that the Mahdi will appear in the Haramain. So they will go and they will be inquiring about this. And 
this will be a group of the ulama, the main ulama of different parts of They'll just go there themselves, you know, looking for a, uh, some kind of relief from the problems. And I haven't mentioned the many other aspects. I've just talked about the minor signs. But leading up to the Mahdi, there is to be some serious stuff. And, you know, if you want to learn about that, we are actually doing a detailed course about this, which is always put up online on zamzamacademy.com. We finished the early signs. We're on the intermediate signs. We'll be, inshallah, moving to the major signs. But in great detail, it's not the time to do here. Where it's going to get a lot worse. If you think this is bad right now, according to what is mentioned, it's going to be some serious stuff. But finally, what will happen <coughs> is that ulama will be going to the haram to look for Mahdi. And they will eventually, in that, the right year, they will hear that the Mahdi is around and they will find him. And they will say, Oh Mahdi, whose name is, will be Muhammad, the responsibility is on your shoulders. This is some matter that you have to take up. The Mahdi will be, he will not want to take it on because, you know, he probably doesn't feel up, whatever the situation is. In fact, it says that they will follow him from, they, they will, he, will, he will quickly go to Medina, they'll go there, they'll quickly come to Mecca. Finally, he will, when, he, when he is really told, and he will, he will reveal himself. That will be a, eventually a global phenomenon. That's the beginning of the major signs, where things will change in this world. Then. After that, <clears throat> what will happen is, the Mahdi will have many people behind him. And then the Dajjal will appear. Now that's a story on its own. But I'm just giving you the highlights. The Dajjal will appear and it says that he will come from the east. From Khurasan or Isfahan. Isfahan is in the general Khurasan area of the earlier days. Which Isfahan I think today is in, is in Iran. And there are, there are details about exactly it says that it will be from the Jews of Isfahan or from Khurasan. And he will come and he will start to create his corruption. What it says about the Dajjal is that the reason, you see the hadith, they mention, the Prophet ﷺ said that there's not been any prophet who did not warn their people about the coming of the Dajjal. Even Nuh ﷺ warned his people of the coming of the Dajjal and how bad and severe a problem he's going to be. In fact, what the Prophet ﷺ said is that he is the worst of the fitness that are being awaited. Now put that in perspective. Think to yourself, what is your worst fitna? Is it women? I'm talking to the men. Is it women? Is it money? Is it good cars? Something that you know you should not be indulging too much in, which makes you miss your prayer, makes you commit haram, makes you do wrong, but you just can't help it. It's just a fitna. You know it's wrong. That's a fitna. A fitna is a challenge. It's something which you know you shouldn't be doing, but you just can't help it. So think of your worst fitna. How we're unable to avoid it. Well, Dajjal is supposed to be worse than all of that. When you think of it that way, you just hope that you're not there. That Allah take you before that. Because can you imagine? Right? We, we've got problems with our own little fitness that we have around us. So can you imagine the Dajjal? However, let us give some... The, the whole point of this is not to make people scared. It's about preparing ourselves. The Prophet sallallahu said, Hadith of Muslim, Man qara'a ashra ayatim min awwali surat al-kahf, usima min fitnat al-dajjal. In another version it says, min awakhiri surat al-kahf. Read the first minimum, read the first or last ten verses of surat al-kahf at least once in a while, at least once a week. If you can read surat al-kahf once a week on Friday, then do that because that will be a protection from the dajjal for you. You will be able to see through it. And the thing is that the Prophet ﷺ said that he will have kafara on his forehead, clear the kafir. But just like with everything else, the matter will be so confusing, you won't know what's right and wrong. So despite the fact that it will be so clear, yet as we see it today, clear wrongs and people still do it, justification. They justify it in some way or the other. It's only the people with penetrating deep iman that will be able to understand this. But inshallah, reciting Surah Al-Kahf will inshallah prepare us. Not just reciting it, try to understand Surah Al-Kahf. Surah Al-Kahf actually has three major stories, incidents that it mentions. 
which are very important to understand the differences between the truth and the batil. And anybody who understands them will be more prepared to understand when the Dajjal comes. I think we should start doing tafsir of Surah Al-Kahf. We tell people to read it every week, but I think we should give the people the tafsir of Surah Al-Kahf. It's very important because that really talks about haq and batil. You're talking about the Ashab Al-Kahf themselves, the people of the cave, and how they were able to sustain themselves, protect themselves despite the tyrant ruler of the time. And he talks about two other incidents, right? That are, that are very major. But anyway, that is being said as a protection from the Dajjal. Before the Dajjal comes, it's mentioned that the Imams, uh, sorry, that the mention of the Dajjal will be made to be forgotten. The, the news of the Dajjal, people will not really know that there is going to be such a fitna. Well, then this program here is a good sign, inshallah. Because what it mentions is that people will be made to forget that this Dajjal will come. So, he'll, so when he comes, you will be unprepared. And when he does come, he'll do these strange things. There will be, it says that three years before that, they were, the, world will, the world will be struck with drought. In the, in the third year before, right, the first of the years, there will be one third less product, pr pr production of, uh, you know, of essential grains and things of that nature. Right? Which will obviously cause prices to go up and so on. We've seen that recently anyway. Pr uh, the price of rice doubled in three years. Literally doubled. Right? The second year, two-thirds less production. It's going to be a drought. And the third year, meaning the year just before the Jal comes, there's going to be no production, there's going to be a major drought. When the Jal comes, Allah will give him certain powers to increase his fitna. All of this is under the wisdom of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to test the people. He will be able to cause the rain to come down. How Allah knows best. But now, you know, with what they're doing with the reflections and things of that nature, Allah knows best. You know, there's lots of conspiracy theories. He will be able to cause plants to grow. Now, already they have what they call sterile seeds, genetically modified seeds of essential products, essential things, which have been modified in such a way that they give you a great crop, but then they do not regenerate. And they also take a lot of the nutrition of the ground. Many countries that were major, the big producers of wheat are now importing wheat. And there are certain companies that, are, that have these seeds. And you would want to buy them because they give you a good crop. But then you are dependent on them after that. Because it spoils your, your earth, your ground, your soil to produce, reproduce naturally the normal one when these genetically modified ones have been used. Allah knows best if this has anything to do with it. But there are some people who like to consider all of these things to be Dajjalic. I make, you know, I make no comment in that. Allah knows best, that's what I say. But it does sound sinister. So when Dajjal will come, he will tell people to believe him. The problem with thinking about Dajjal that we've been told is that nothing will be correct the way you see it. So if you are persecuted by him, then if you persevere and you make sabr, you will find that it will, be, it will be bright for you. It will be nur for you and light for you. Even if he's going to burn you or whatever the case is, you will find that it will be a blessing for you as long as you've had the patience. Everything will be just so distorted. So he will do a number of things. Anyway, we don't have the time to talk about the jal in detail. But then as we go along, Mahdi alayhi salatu wasalam will be knowing about this. But he will not have power against the Dajjal. That will be reserved for Isa alayhi salam. So eventually Mahdi alayhi salam will be in Jerusalem with a Muslim army. With the Muslims behind him. Isa alayhi salatu wasalam, the Prophet Jesus peace be upon him, will suddenly descend. Fajr time or Asr time, there are different narrations about this. On the eastern minaret of the mosque of the great masjid in Damascus. That masjid did not exist during the time of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasalam. But he said, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasalam said, and Damascus was not even conquered at that time. It was under the Christians. It was under the, the Romans. The Prophet ﷺ said that Isa والسلام, will descend. When he will bow his head, when he will put his head down, it will, it's almost as if he's just taken a bath and drops of, drops of uh, water will fall from his, from his forehead. He will have clothing that seems to be colored in some kind of yellowish, yellowish color. He will come to the eastern minaret 
of the masjid in Damascus. Now, alhamdulillah, I managed to study in that masjid. There is an eastern minaret, the white eastern minaret. It's not open anymore. You know, they keep it closed. But the Jami al Umawi, the Umayyad mosque, which was uh, built by the Umayyads, Walid ibn Abdul Malik, I believe. It's a very large masjid, with a very large courtyard, really big. And in that corner, behind that corner, is the Christian quarters of Damascus. It's very interesting stuff. This is, I mean, this is stuff that I've seen myself. And it says that Isa alayhi salatu wasalam will be brought down by angels and then he will come down. And then he will lead the people in Asr prayer, it says. Christians would have gathered, the Jews would have gathered, and the Muslims would have gathered. And when Isa alayhi salatu they will all know that Isa alayhi salatu wasalam is about to come. They'll all be waiting for him. Now when the salat time comes in, each one of them will want to call the people to pray using the Muslims' adhan, the others, they'll be wanting to use their horn, the, the Jews and the others, the bells. But the, it will be the Muslims uh, that will be chosen to give their adhan. And the Christians, it says that they will immediately recognize Isa alayhi salatu wasalam. His function in the world, unlike before when he came as a prophet, when he will return, he will come as an ummati, as just a member of the ummah of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam, but with special uh, things that he has to do. It says that he will destroy the crosses, kill the swine, and when the Christians see this and they see, they recognize him. And remember, the the Jews are still waiting for their Messiah. They did not recognize Isa alayhi salatu wasallam when he first came. They rejected him, right? The Jews. They will recognize him. And he will tell them the truth. So all the Christians will convert to the true faith. The Jews that will initially fight with him along with the Dajjal, they will fight with him. But then after the Dajjal is killed, the Jews will follow him as well. But anyway, that's fast forwarding. What I want to talk about here now is that finally Isa alayhi salatu wasalam will go to Jerusalem. He's, because he will be told that the Dajjal is coming. Now Dajjal will not be able to enter Makkah and Medina, Munawwara. The Jal will go towards Jerusalem. And Isa alayhi salatu wasalam will go there in pursuit of him. And he says he'll get there like not, not, not too long. It mentions in one narration that the Jal will have a donkey whose ears will be this many cubits long. And that just sounds strange. But does it sound strange? Because if you look at that, what is clearly, that, that's not a very strong hadith. But what's clearly mentioned is that Isa alayhi salatu wasalam will catch up to Dajjal by the door of Lud, Babul Lud. In what, and, and I've been to Lud, it's in Israel. It's, that's where the Ben Gurion International Airport is, in a place called Lud. Lud is actually a predominantly Muslim sit, uh, town. There's a Tablighi Markaz there as well, Jama'ah Markaz there, right? And <clears throat> it's close to uh, the Ben Gurion International Airport. It's on the way from Jerusalem to Tel Aviv. That, it says Lud. The place is still called Lud. They call it Lod, L-O-D, right? Um, Isa alayhi salatu wasalam will follow him up to there. When he will come to Jerusalem, Masjid Laqsa, there is a door that, has, and, I, and I've seen this door, the, I think it's called a golden gate or something. It's never been opened. They said it's only going to be open when Isa alayhi salatu wasalam will come. It's a door that is kind of from the outside cemetery. right? And Mahdi alayhi salatu wasalam will already have, Iqama would have already been given. And Mahdi alayhi salam will be waiting there to start the salat. And be, he'll be told Isa alayhi salatu wasalam is here. He'll want to move back to let Isa alayhi salatu wasalam lead the prayer. But Isa alayhi salatu wasalam will say, no, no, it's been given, the iqama has been given for you, you lead the salat. So he will finish, he will lead the prayer. And after that, Isa alayhi salatu wasalam will go in pursuit of Dajjal. He'll be told that he is by Lud. When he gets to Lud, he's not seen Dajjal before. But Dajjal is very fearful of Isa alayhi salatu wasalam. Isa alayhi salatu wasalam has given, has been given um, uh, a certain breath which will just make Dajjal just, just wither away. When he will get and meet up with Dajjal, catch up with Dajjal, Dajjal is very crafty. That's what Dajjal means. Dajjal means to just confuse and distort. That's what Dajjal means. And Dajjal is the one who does that a lot. So that's exactly who he is, the Antichrist. Right? That's his title basically. So he will... 
when Isa والسلام, will come, the Jal will try to confuse the matter by saying, quickly, uh, get everybody ready for Salat. And he'll say to Isa والسلام, come on, Salat time. And the Jal, uh, Isa والسلام, will say, I've seen through you. And the Jal will then just wither away and Isa والسلام, will finish the Jal off. So that's the end of the Jal. It's a very quick end in my, in my you know, uh, narration of events. But believe me, it's going to be a lot worse than that. They say that he will be in the world for 40 days. The first day will seem like a year. Whether in reality it will be a year and you'd have to separate the days because of the sun or something, Wallahu alam, or it's just that it will seem like that because the matter, you know when a day goes really, really slowly because there's just one problem after another problem and it just expands the day. Can you imagine a year? The second day will be like a month. The third day will be like a week, and then the rest of the days will be like your normal days. That's how long the Dajjal will stay. After that, after, he, after he's taken care of, there will be peace that will settle in the world. Isa والسلام, will be there. Peace will settle in the world in such a way that it mentions that wolves will play along with sheeps and sheep, and there'll be, there'll be no, no problems at all. The whole world will be believers in Allah again, in the true faith. After that, Isa is mentions that he will marry, then he will die a mortal death, and then after that he will pass away, he will leave this world, and then the matter will disintegrate again, the matter will diminish again, and there will be problems again. Eventually what will happen, and I'm just going to just give you the, the highlights after this. Eventually what will happen is that one day, the Muslims will open up the Quran, and they'll find no words there anymore. The script would have all disappeared. The Quran would have been lifted. The books will still be there. The copies will still be there. But the, 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 uh, the, the script will have gone. I can see that happening very simply with the Quran on our phones. Delete. It's gone. The, the, the file is gone. So you've got your gadget. But it's gone. And slowly, slowly, if you look even in Ramadan, we've got so many. I'm not saying it's wrong. I'm just saying that these things, Wallahu alam, how they're going to happen. Whether... Physical copies of any books will actually remain. Everything will become electronic, electronic book, you know, the Kindle and so on. So I can just see it happening. And otherwise, when you read about this 20 years ago, how can all copies just suddenly, the words just disappear? But you can see how that's just so much easier to happen now. Just delete. Right? It's a major virus, whatever. Allah, Allah knows best. But there's a reason why this will happen. After that, the sun will rise. One day it would have set. And suddenly it will re-rise from the place of its sitting. Min maghribiha. It will re-rise from the place of its sitting. Of its, uh, of its setting. And so there will be a very short night as such. That marks, the end, that marks the closing of the doors of acceptance of any forgiveness. Therefore, after this. Now this is a critical point. Because now, no du'as will be accepted. No conversions will be accepted. Because it's, it's all ended now. Then the Dabba will come. This is the beast. Right? This is the special beast that Allah will send. It, and how that's going to be, Allah knows best. But it will mark each person as a believer or a disbeliever. Because now it's all set. You cannot change anymore. The doors of all of that change is closed. And acceptance have closed. That signals the absolute you know, running down of events. Then a wind, a soft wind will blow. And all of those who believe... They will feel it under their armpits and they will slowly perish from that. They will die out. Depart from this world. And then the time will come when there is not a single person to say Allah, Allah. Allah, Allah is the nourishment for this world. This world, in, as mentioned in the hadith, sustains itself because people say Allah, Allah. Allah keeps it going. It's the, it's the food of the world. It's the sustenance of the world. When there's nothing like that, the day of judgment will occur. And that will be the final day. Going back with all of these events, does it matter when Mahdi comes? No. Because whenever a person dies, that's his Qiyamah. Who knows who's going to be there when Isa والسلام, will come. I forgot one major, one major incident. That after Isa والسلام, has dealt with the Antichrist, the Dajjal, another fitna will begin, which is the Gog Magog. Ya'juj ma'juj. When kulli hadabin yansilun. They'll just come out from everywhere. 
that will be something Isa alayhi salatu wasalam will not be given the power to deal with just like he dealt with Dajjal. He will not be able to just go and deal with it like that. They will, the Muslims with Isa, the believers with Isa alayhi salatu wasalam will go, they say Mount Tur, <coughs> and Isa alayhi salatu wasalam will finally make a dua there, which will then, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will send down something and cause all of them to be destroyed. So that's how he will be delivered from Gog Magog. One of the reasons the ulama give for why Isa والسلام, will have power over the Dajjal but not Gog Magog is that just now so many Christians who thought Jesus was their God have just become believers in the true way. They've just seen him kill the Antichrist. For those who still had lingering thoughts that he is God, it will reinforce that, which creates a problem with their iman. When he is not seen to have power over Ya'juj, Ma'juj the same way, that will moderate their faith and give them their true faith. Right? And Allah knows best. But these are the things that have been mentioned. The main thing for us though, is that for us, our thing that we have to look forward to as such and prepare for is our own day of judgment. Right? Which could be tomorrow, which could be right now, it could be in the next minute, the next hour, the next year. We forget Mahdi alayhi salam in the sense that we need to know that and believe that these things will happen but if we are not prepared and we die before Mahdi Isa alayhi salam, any of that comes then what's the point the point is not Mahdi he is I mean some people think that and, and people in history thought this that the matter is so severe that only Mahdi alayhi salatu salam and these end of time events can actually change the situation and then things got better They've been up and down. So you think that this is the worst of times that it will never get better after this? We may be absolutely wrong. Things could just suddenly turn to uh, the absolute, take a turnaround and you could have another thousand years of prosperity of the Muslims. But that's not our point. The point we have to focus on is that are we fulfilling our daily res re responsibilities? That if we were to die tomorrow, Allah is not going to say, you know, the, did you wait for the Mahdi? You know, the, what did you prepare for that? What did you prepare for your standing in front of me? That is what's important. So that's what I'm going to leave us with. Don't get all besotted about when Mahdi is coming and the world is this situation. Let us focus on what my responsibility and your responsibility is. And what the Prophet ﷺ said in that regard is that Saddidu wa qaribu. In another version of the hadith, the Prophet ﷺ said Saddidu wa abshiru. Try to hit the mark or at least get close to it. Another version says hit the mark and accept the glad tidings. What that is basically saying is that istiqama, absolute perfect following of the faith is very difficult. That's why the Prophet ﷺ said to the Sahaba that you, if you just miss out 10% of what you have been commanded to do, you are destroyed. Expectation from them was very high. There will come a time when people, if they just follow one-tenth of what they have been ordered to do, if they just follow that much, they would be successful. I don't think we're right there yet. I think we might be somewhere in between. I just hope. Because we seriously have lackings. And I would just hope that we're somewhere in between. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala standard for us is a bit low. Because, you know, we, 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 that's our weakness. But the point I'm saying is that this hadith gives us a lot of... It says, try to hit the mark. Don't aim wrong. So, example, don't not set your clock for fajr. Set it. If they can't wake up, then you seek forgiveness. You try something else tomorrow. But don't just go to sleep and not set it at all. That is, you're not even trying. You're completely hitting the wrong mark there. You're setting it for work and not for fajr. That's wrong. This is a simple example. So in everything, try to make your salat proper. Your dress and everything, it, it, it happens slowly. But don't ever justify a position for yourself that is wrong and thinking that I'm in this country, I'm here, I've got this problem or whatever. That's why it's okay for me to uh, be like this or like that. You know it. We know we're doing wrongs. Let us hope that we can do better tomorrow. So that every subsequent year is better than the previous. Every, every coming year is better than the previous year. Then if we were to pass away, at least we're on the move towards Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala looks at our intentions. So even if we're not perfect, because you know we're all weak, there's no doubt about that. But let us try to do better, not justify things away. But let's try to think that I'm going to do better. I know I'm doing wrong now. I can't, you know, maybe... For the women, you know, I can't cover my hair or my face right now, whatever it is, I can't keep my beard or I can't make my salat five times, salat on time, I can't eat proper halal food all the time. I want to do it tomorrow, inshallah. 
It's not that oh, I don't need to do it. Oh, it's okay, I've got a fatwa from somewhere. You know, that's what I'm talking Don't justify things away. Understand that we're doing wrong. Understand that we're involved in maybe haram and wrong things. And we ask Allah to strengthen us and to make us better. So that at least tomorrow we do better than today. If that's the ambition, then inshallah we can stand in front of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and maybe have something to say. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala accept from all of us. May Allah reward you for your patience. It was a bit scrambled here and there, but th that's the way these things are. If you really want to give a kind of overall picture, hopefully you understood the early signs, the middle signs, and the final major signs. And may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala allow us to prepare for our deaths, which is closer to us than any one of these events, and which is more important for us. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala allow us to see the truth as the truth and to follow it. And may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala allow us to see the wrong as the wrong and to abstain from it. That's very important. That's a very important dua that we must make. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala not allow our hearts to deviate after He's given us guidance. And may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala not cause us to doubt the truth after He's given us conviction in the truth. These are very important things for the maintenance of our faith. Allahumma inna na'udhu bika min ash shakki fil haqqi ba'd al yaqeen. That's a dua that we should all read. So may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give us that tawfiq wa akhiru da'wana and alhamdulillahi rabbi.